to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Today, let's compare the GHRPs, the growth hormone-releasing peptides, but we're going to look at them from more of a nerdy standpoint. Some of these things include how they mechanistically work and their pharmacokinetic profile, among other factors and characteristics. So the contenders in our discussion today are GHRP2, GHRP6, ipamorelin, hexarelin, and finally a special non-peptide shout-out to ibutamarin, or MK677, which although is technically a non-peptide, acts very similar to its peptide friends, ultimately as a growth hormone secretagogue. So when we're looking at these from a practical standpoint, it's, in my opinion, best to make comparisons side by side rather than as a whole, even though we're going to try our best, and this is because one, the way they work is quite similar. Two, the research on some of these compounds like GHRP6 and GHRP2 was conducted when they were discovered decades prior, and three, in general, data on the subject is limited. What I did was make a chart comparing them that we'll get into later in the video, and given these limitations, it's of course not the end-all be-all, but it is, in my opinion, not to toot my own horn, as best of a synthesis of information that I can provide without being over-promising. If this is all you're looking for, fast forward through this next informational mechanistic standpoint. I did do an investigation posted on Patreon about how these peptides actually work, so we can have an overview on the biochemical functions involved and receptors at play, which is what we're going to take a look at first. Let's talk about how GHRPs actually work. We've covered the different components of the hormonal axis they're involved with and differentiated between these peptides and the growth hormone releasing hormone analogs, but I realized I've said the receptor they bind to rather than actually portraying it, which you guys may find interesting, or on the contrary, it could put you to sleep, but regardless, let's talk about it. Although the influences on the growth hormone release pathway are multifarious and not well understood, we know different components that are stimulatory and inhibitory. For instance, release of growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus would stimulate release of growth hormone from the pituitary and subsequent release of insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, from the liver. Somatostatin serves as inhibitory to growth hormone release, and while release of ghrelin, the hunger hormone by the cells of the stomach, would serve to accelerate or augment growth hormone release. However, there's more intricacy and complexity to this process than at this point we're able to really elucidate. For instance, in findings that ghrelin may both inhibit and stimulate somatostatin release, that can be a bit confusing, but in general, these are components of growth hormone release people try to manipulate when taking these peptides. In particular, though, when clinicians think about ghrelin in the context of growth hormone, the use of these GHRPs lies strongly rooted in the idea that ghrelin is stimulatory towards the release of growth hormone and would counter the inhibitory nature of the release of somatostatin. And just as the relationship between ghrelin and somatostatin appears to be context-specific in a way, it seems apparent when we talk about the results of binding of ghrelin to its receptor versus when the GHRPs do themselves. And what these GHRPs GHRPs bind to is called the growth hormone secretagogue receptor, oftentimes noted as the GHSR, which is shared by ghrelin, hence why I'm oftentimes referring to it as the ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor, because it's just that, it's the receptor for both of these types of compounds. And although it's in part responsible for many different functions, from hunger, glucose, and lipid metabolism to immunity, what we're focused on is binding's stimulatory effect on the release of growth hormone. That's why peptides like GHRP2, GHRP6, ipamorelin, anamorelin, and non-peptide ibutamarin or MK677 bind to this GHSR, which is found seated on the somatotroph surface on the anterior pituitary. And there are two isoforms of this receptor. There is 1A and 1B, 1A of which is coined the active form, so it's theorized to be the one responsible for these hormonal changes. And the effects of compounds binding to the GHSR1A are mediated through calcium, which, although it's an ion, it's also a popular secondary messenger in the body, which means it's oftentimes involved in signal transduction. And so essentially, these compounds that resemble ghrelin bind to the GHSR1A, which in turn induces calcium signaling and subsequent stimulation of growth hormone release amongst other hormonal and metabolic influences, likely through stimulatory effects 
on the pituitary, but also through possible inhibition of somatostatin release. But for instance, the direct role in insulin release via this interaction is unclear. However, we know that the whole process affects more than just release of growth hormone alone. So when I say that the hormonal pathway is intricate and complex, I mean it. So when I'm asked to predict all physiologic outcomes, from my standpoint at least, it's pretty darn close to impossible. However, it's likely correct to state that the more these receptors are exposed to stimulation by peptides, the more likely it is that their transcription of subsequent production would decrease, which would imply decreased efficacy of the synthetic agonists over time. How much time? Another good question I don't quite know the answer to. But one more thing worth talking about is that the receptors involved in the binding of these GHRPs are thought to possess different functions. For instance, while binding the GHSR is thought to influence anti-apoptotic properties of cells within the heart, it's also known as a promiscuous receptor, which pretty much means it's involved with a complex variety of functions, some of which are thought to include reward pathways, feeding, and components of memory, among other signaling pathways. CD36, on the other hand, is thought to function in the realm of pro-survival pathways that, similar to GHSR in some regards, can lead to reduction in cellular death and perceived anti-inflammatory properties. And while these combined findings lead to the many realms of research on these peptides, from growth hormone augmentation and cancer-related muscle wasting to organ-specific effects and metabolic influences, saying what will happen precisely when taking these peptides is understandably very tough, not to mention understanding Rowan's precise relationship relationship with somatostatin is still a point of controversy in research. And on top of that, the recreational use of these peptides, if you will, differs from the clinical applications in which they were investigated. Okay, so now that we've got our overview, let's dive into the graphic I developed. So our categories here are when the compound was approximately discovered, approximate elimination half-life, potency comparisons, overarching extent of clinical evaluation, effect on appetite, and finally review the risks of this family of peptides in general. Now, when we're addressing potency, it's along the lines of likely growth hormone increase per dose. However, given the paucity of data assessing this, it's likely variable as no data has compared some sort of standardized dose among these peptides since it doesn't exist. And finally, individual differences in metabolism of these products is affected by other things like age and weight, among other factors. Factors. And keep in mind, we have individual videos diving into each of these clinical contexts, evaluating and even research and development of each of these peptides, so this will be more of an overview for quickly accessible information. Okay, so let's go through this handy-dandy chart together. For those of you who hate and despise absolutely hearing my voice, feel free to pause and just look at it yourself. That said, we've got our list of compounds and these different facets that we're taking a look at. So as far as isolation goes, GHRP6 was the first discovered likely in the early 1980s, maybe even the late 70s, depending on what you read. That said, GHRP2 came about not long after. Then we've got ipermorelin, which was somewhere in the 1990s, early 2000s, hexarelin, 1990s as well, as was ibutamarin or MK677. As far as elimination half-life goes for GHRP6, you'll see somewhere in the range of 2 to 2.5 hours, GHRP2 about 30 minutes, ipermorelin about 2 hours, hexarelin about 55 minutes, and ibutamarin much longer acting. It's less clear. You'll see some data indicating 6 to 13 hours in different animal models, but it's approximately up to a day in humans. And as I was saying earlier about potency, it's much easier for our sake and just in general to look at them side by side. So we know that GHRP6 is slightly less potent than GHRP2, while well, of course, GHRP2 is slightly more potent than GHRP6. Ipamorelin is less potent than these GHRPs. Hexarelin is likely the most potent in this list, as in GH increase per dose is maximized, likely greater than GHRP2, greater than GHRP6. And while ibutamarin is likely less potent than hexarelin, it does have of note a sustained duration of action given the significantly prolonged half-life. Like I said, with these clinical trials, definitely take a look at these individual videos. I do actually have playlists that you can look at and search through that have each of these compounds within them, as well as their precise clinical pathways, different research and development companies involved, and we really look through their outcome in the industry, essentially. But GHRP6 made its way through some phase one and phase two evaluation, GHRP2 phase two, ipamorelin stopped in phase two as well, same with hexarelin, and ibutamarin is the most promising currently 
recently with completed phase two trials finding its way in phase three trials currently, and hopefully we'll have some of the outcomes of that soon. As far as appetite goes, there's definitely individual variables at play, but all of these should elevate appetite in some way or another, with ipamorelin being the one that is most likely neutral. However, that experience isn't shared by everybody. Now, with regards to risk of augmenting growth hormone, a few things do come to mind, and some things certainly concern me, and I know we've discussed these risks ad nauseum in multiple commentary videos and just risk focus focus videos in general, so I'll try not to harp on it too long. But from a very practical standpoint, we can just start out with my concern that natural decrease in growth hormone as we age is likely in a way protective against insulin resistance, decreases in insulin sensitivity, and in some cases, maybe even cancer, as elevation in IGF-1 is certainly tied to different cancerous conditions. And on top of that, from a basic standpoint, just increasing growth isn't as quite specific as we may think, right? for people who have increased risks of certain malignancies, or maybe even a tumor in its infancy, who's to say that injecting these peptides won't spur growth or more rapidly transition something that is in its stages of formation? And finally, when we're talking about buying gray market products of any sort and literally injecting it into your body, who's to say what you're actually getting? Sure, compounding companies and these quote-unquote pharmacies can provide certain information that says how legitimate it is, but there's virtually no consequences from a regulation standpoint if they were to give you bunk products or a certain proportion of inactive ingredients or perhaps even something infectious. And yes, it may be a bit hyperbolic, but some of these could be made in your neighbor's bathtub and you would have no way of knowing, unless of course you guys hang out. Regardless, this was my attempt at a comprehensive, concise overview. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you haven't already, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It goes a long way for a small peptide YouTuber like me. And if you're looking for a way to further support the channel, the details to the Patreon will be in the description below. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.